Well, good morning, David, and thank you so much for stopping what you were doing and taking the time to uh, talk to us today. Uh, it's a pleasure. Sure. So, you know, let's just jump straight in. Um, we're talking about uh, your book, Interpreting Old Testament Wisdom Literature. Um, maybe we could just start at the beginning and assume some of the readers um, don't know the definition of Old Testament w Wisdom Literature or aren't that familiar anyway. Um, what books of the Bible contain wisdom literature, and why is it important to us? Okay, well, the question of what books contain Old Testament wisdom literature is one of the things that people have debated for the last 200 years or so. Mm -hmm. um, so even getting a, an exact definition of what constitutes wisdom literature in the Old Testament has been fairly uncertain. Um, but I think that the three books that most people would recognize as being wisdom literature would be uh, the books of Job, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. And then um, people would indicate that there are some Psalms which would appear to be wisdom texts. Uh, Song of Songs appears to have themes of wisdom. And then there are other elements of wisdom. A number of the prophets make use of wisdom themes as well. So it's it's a, a widespread uh, motif that runs through the whole of the Old Testament, but there are those three books, uh, Job, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes, which are most generally recognized as wisdom. Right. If we ask, why does that matter? Well, it matters because precisely that point that I was just making, so much of the Old Testament uses wisdom techniques to communicate. Uh, so when we read uh, for example, in the book of Amos, Amos in chapter three raises a series of questions about does a bird fall into a trap unless the uh, trap has been set? And of course, the answer is no. Uh, and he's using a wisdom technique. Uh, more importantly than just getting a, an understanding of the Old Testament generally, it also gives us a much better understanding of the ways in which Jesus taught, because in the Gospels, we often find Jesus using uh, techniques and forms of literature that are taken from the wisdom texts. Uh, so again, the very common uh, technique in wisdom is to make an observation based on what can be seen in the natural world, and then from that draw a conclusion about what we can say about God. So in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, where Jesus says, well, consider the lilies of the field, and so on. And then he goes on to say, so you should not worry. Um, Jesus is using wisdom techniques. So if we're going to understand large parts of the Old Testament, not just the three books that are pretty much universally agreed to be wisdom, but also Jesus and much of the New Testament, uh, we actually need a grounding in the wisdom literature. That's fascinating. Um, you, know, you lay that out really well. I'm almost kind of caught off guard, but it's wonderful. Um, <laughs> so... In your book, Interpreting Old Testament Wisdom Literature, it's a it's a collection of writings pulled together by you and Lindsay Wilson, um, yeah. with a, a paper from each of you included. Um, perhaps you could briefly, um, and you know, don't, don't go through the whole book, but just kind of uh, go through the collection to whet the reader's appetite. Yeah, that's fine. There are three main parts to the book. So the first part uh, is only one essay, but it's twice the length of most of the others. Uh, and that tries to situate the study of wisdom literature today in wider discussions uh, about the Old Testament and about how Christians read the Bible. Uh, then we have a second part, which provides an overview of contemporary academic study of each of Job, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. And then there is a, an additional essay there on Song of Songs as the, this book that's kind of sat half in, half out, depending on how people classify it. And then the third section, we take a, a number of themes that um, are, are evident within the wisdom literature or in other texts which make use of wisdom themes so that we uh, are showing that wisdom, again, has this breadth of uh, integration across the Old Testament. Wonderful. So um, probably a, a simple question for you, but which of the... Um, wisdom literature books would you say is your favorite to read and why 
See, I'm not sure that I can ever come to a favourite. Um, I, I think what I find is whichever one I am studying most closely at that time, I find most interesting. Um, and I, I think that's part of the richness of, of the Old Testament anyway. But the one I spend the most time studying is Ecclesiastes. That's not because it's necessarily a favourite, um, although I do greatly enjoy it. Uh, so much as the fact that I teach it to my graduate students every other year, um, although the reason for choosing it was entirely pragmatic. It's just the right length to do in one semester, um, whereas Job and Proverbs are far too long to do in the time that I had available uh, for that class. But one of the things I really enjoy about Ecclesiastes is that Ecclesiastes wrestles with the very sort of real life questions that people wrestle with today um, about life and death and about what constitutes meaning in life and where is God in the midst of, of all of that. And uh, I mean, one of the things I actually do with my students when we study Ecclesiastes is they have to wrestle with the, with the text, but we then also look at a range of um, contemporary popular songs, which explore pretty much exactly the same issues. And we sort of create a dialogue to see, well, how is it that this text from two and a half thousand years ago is asking the questions that people are asking today? But what's also different uh, about what it has to say? So I have great fun doing that. But if I had time to study Proverbs and Job in the same depth, I'd have great fun, but in a slightly different way. Okay, good. Good to know. I, you know, I'd have to guess that um, for your students, Ecclesiastes is their favorite now. <laughs> well, they, they certainly come out of it having a great time, although they, they do say that my definition of contemporary shows for the music shows my age. Ah, uh, I was going to say, you know, you could write, there, there's, there's probably a song in there, but okay, I guess it's showing my age as well. Um. Oh, well, they, just, to, just to show your age, read Ecclesiastes 2 and ask, what have I worked so hard for? Why have I got all this wealth when I can't use it? And then listen to Joe Walsh's song, Life's Been Good, about the, the problems of a rock star who's got a mansion he can never live in and a fast car he can't drive. And uh, it, it's exploring the exact same questions. That's, that's awesome. I was thinking, it, I was going back to the birds, but... Um... Uh, well, turn, 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 of course, we have to do uh, when we do Ecclesiastes 3. Um, but I also do Pink Floyd's Time for that chapter because um, it picks up uh, the, some lines from Ecclesiastes 3 as well. Yeah, that, 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 that kind of thing is always very interesting. So now, now hopefully everybody, after they uh, read or listen to this, they'll uh, go back. Um, so your chapter in the book, um, Worrying About the Wise, Wisdom in Old Testament Narrative, um, speaking of wrestling, that was a, a really interesting chapter on bouncing back and forth about wisdom. Perhaps you could share a little bit of light about uh, your chapter. Yeah, my own scholarly work has actually predominantly been on the Psalms and uh, Joshua to Kings. Uh, so I wanted to really say, well, these are the texts that I work on most of the time. How does that interact with the wisdom literature. And one of the things that I found really surprising, and, and I'm not aware of anyone who's done a substantial study of the theme of wisdom in these texts before. Uh, so one of the things I found really surprising is that when I read uh, Proverbs or Job or Ecclesiastes, they all point to being wise and to the wise as a good thing and this kind of an assumption that someone calling themselves wise is a good thing. When I read the historical books, although they make use of wisdom at various points, so wisdom itself isn't something that is disparaged, there seems to be this sense that uh, they are concerned that there are some people who are almost trying to claim the label for themselves and therefore as a result of that claim that they have some special authority that others wouldn't have. And, and I think the historical books uh, are wanting to show that wisdom, when we understand wisdom as a life surrendered to God and working out how God's purposes are there, 
is a good thing. But it's very nervous about people wanting to claim that they are wise um, because people who claim that they are wise often bring a lot of trouble. Uh, and uh, I was, as I was writing the, the essay, I was reminded of struggles I've seen in some churches where people claim to have special levels of insight and that everyone has to listen to them uh, and reminding myself that the problems that we sometimes have in our churches today are are issues that were being wrestled with in great depth in ancient Israel as well. Absolutely. So I guess the moral of that story is have wisdom, but don't claim to be wise. Yeah, um, I, I suppose if somebody else set, tells you you are wise um, and you hadn't necessarily thought of yourself in that way, that's a good thing. It's a bit like somebody being able to tell you that you're humble, I suppose, rather <laughs> than someone claiming themselves to be humble. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, it's always interesting to put together a collection like this and that, um, especially for, I guess for the editors, um, as you were putting these collections together and reading through them and seeing which ones were going in and weren't going in and what order, was there anything that really popped out of you, uh, at you of particular interest or brought you some new revelation that you, uh, weren't already aware of? Well, the, doing my own paper was obviously the point where that happened most fully because I was engaging with text and asking a question, as I said, I'd not seen before. But for me, it it was more a case of reinforcing the richness of what is there in the wisdom literature, uh, but also hearing from people who have given their scholarly lives to the study of these texts uh, to recognize the insights that they bring and, and the themes that sometimes you know, just get passed over far too quickly that need to be to be brought out into the open. So um, the question of Lennart Bostrom's essay on retribution and how is it that God is at work in our world, uh, I think is a very, very important one because people ask those questions. How is God at work? What is he doing? Um, if, if there is evil and we see it, how, how should that be addressed? And that's a, a really rich question. So I really enjoyed working with Lenart's uh, essay, um, but also Simon Stock's one uh, on the uh, Psalms and how just the act of giving voice in worship itself does something to help us understand what, is, what it is to be wise. And that reminder of real wisdom is grounded in real worship. Uh, I thought that was a very, very helpful thing. I, I could say nice things about all the papers, but uh, those were ones that I found especially helpful. All right. Well, you know, David, thank you so much for um, sharing with us. Um, I hope everyone picks up a copy, Interpreting Old Testament Wisdom Literature. I think it's um, an important issue. I know a lot of people get stuck at least, you know, in America with reading the New Testament and not and kind of avoiding the Old Testament. This is a really fascinating uh, bit to go to and uh, maybe get start start to get um, more familiar with the Old Testament and reading it on a regular basis. So thanks. Thanks for the book and thanks for talking to us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.